everyone. You are listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. I am Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the wonderful Taryn Hatcher. Taryn, the Flyers have a win. That six-game losing streak is in the past. But there was notable news on Monday as they enter March here. Morgan Frost sent down to the Phantoms. He's no longer with the Flyers. He is out of the lineup and back in the AHL. Going to develop his game there, try to build back his confidence. I think there's a big disagreement from some people that they think he should be up here developing with the Flyers at this level. Some people probably are okay with some of the growing pains. Taryn, where do you sit with this? Are you okay with Frost going back to the Phantoms? Yeah, I think, honestly, one of – Morgan did have – some nice flashes, I want to say, right after the All-Star break, if I'm remembering correctly, where it seemed like his game got a bit of a jolt after he got called back up after he was initially sent down during the All-Star break and then for a little bit after it. Um, So that was good to see. Um, But I do think it's one of those things with Morgan where the discussion around him always has been and it continues to be that – He's a guy who should be playing with top six type skill players. That's really where his game um, excels and so on and so forth. And I think genuinely speaking, I think Derek Broussard up on the second line probably helps the Flyers more right now. And if Morgan's not going to play there, then he should probably be playing in Lehigh where he can get more ice time and, And, you know, the discussion in the writer's room was that he'll probably be playing with Tanner Lazinski down in Lehigh. And it might not be the worst thing to have those two playing together, developing chemistry together, um, you know, two skilled guys that are potential future guys. Um, And who knows? I mean, I, I think it's kind of one of these situations where, it's not six of one, half a dozen of the other, but I think there's positives and negatives to both sides of the argument. And so whatever Chuck Fletcher or Mike Yo was seeing, um, it seems like there were more positives to sending him down than positives to keeping him up. Um, or maybe there are less negatives to sending him down than there were to keeping him up. Um, so I think it's one of those things where if they chose to keep him up, I wouldn't be – angry and wondering why they do it and them sending him down. I also totally understand. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I think the Flyers are fighting this battle here of they want to win games, but how, how important are wins right now at this point in the season? Not, not super important, maybe towards like eventually building a winning culture again and getting back to thinking you're a contender and building winning habits. That stuff's all important, but they had guys that were out playing Morgan Frost, and those guys deserve to be higher in the lineup. So Morgan was playing in a third-line role with a couple of kids like Jerry Mayhew and Max Willman, and maybe, yeah, he just wasn't producing. And at that point, I think the Flyers are getting healthier. Derek Broussard is back. Um, they've gotten some wingers back. Their lineup Derek Broussard looked good the other day. Like, he, he did. was good. So yeah. it's it's kind of not like you can argue that Morgan should be in a spot where, where – you know what I mean? Like, that yeah. argument – doesn't work really no and Derek Broussard I think needs to play I think he deserves to play he's a good player and when he's healthy I think he can help the Flyers and he needs to be showcased too they're they're Mm -hmm. trying to trade him by March 21st uh he's not a part of the future here but he could get you something back so he needs to play he needs to be showcased and Taryn I think there's this argument of like well Morgan Frost should be playing with like you mentioned top six players put him with Claude Drew K. Mackinson, and and Mike Yo kind of shot that down today. He said they didn't have centers. They didn't have people to play. They didn't have the luxury to put Morgan with the best players in this lineup. And I kind of agree with that. I think eventually Morgan Frost is 22 years old. He's had some games under his belt at this level. He needs to produce with whoever he's playing with. I don't think he should be on a fourth line, but I certainly think he can produce on a third line. And if you look at his play since January – since the calendar turned to 2022, he's had two points in 18 games, two assists. He's played about 13 minutes a game. That's not terrible. That's not mm-hmm. fourth line minutes. He's gotten the opportunity and just hasn't produced. I think there needs to be a time where you got to give this kid games. And if he's not producing, if he's not really developing the way you think he should, have him go to the Phantoms and build back his confidence. And I just yeah. think that's where the Flyers are at this point. And 
I'm not terribly um, disagreeing with it. I just don't, you know, I just don't think the Flyers were in position to play him with Claude Drew and Cam Atkinson and have him play with the best players for 10, 12 games. I thought he got a fair shot here. He's played 30 games uh, now with the Flyers this year. I think in a perfect world, they would have loved to maybe see him with the Phantoms for the full year, maybe a couple stints here and there. But I think they they are where they are with Morgan Frost. He needs to go back to the Phantoms and I think work his way back here, in my opinion. Well, too. and the thing is, is like we saw, okay, so we see Joel come back into the lineup for the first time since January 20th, I want to say was his last game. Um, and instantly that line looks better. Like instantly you get Joel back and that line looks better, right? Yeah. And I, I know they want Frost to become that type of guy, but right now he's not. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we spoke with Morgan about and we talked to him at the beginning of the season was that he does want to be a player. It's pretty clear that I think Morgan sees it as, and this is just, he's not said this blatantly out loud, but piecing, reading between the lines, certain things. I do think he looks at that narrative around him that he has to play top six or he shouldn't be playing as kind of an obstacle because it is, it's basically like you can't, really play bottom six competently. You need to be with skilled players. And those positions really don't open, especially when you've got Sean Couturier and Kevin Hayes, both on really long contracts. Hmm. Um, And it seemed very clear to me, his focus and the narrative he wanted to at least establish in an interview with me was that he could do those things that you need from third and fourth line guys. He was even talking about if they want to put me on the fourth line, they need me to be physical and grind guys down. I want to become that player and I want to show that I can be that player. So I have that value to the team also. I mean, I, and I I respect that a lot, that you're sitting there and saying, like, essentially, I would love to play with Claude Giroux and people think I probably should be playing with skilled guys, but that might not be the case and I need to be okay with that too. Mm-hmm. The problem is, again, I think after the break, those first few games, there were things I did like about the way Morgan played and the way he, like how active he looked in certain ways that I think he wants to show. But um, it's got to be consistent and it's got to be productive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the one thing I was talking to Jonesy about, I know wins don't mean a lot in terms of like actually helping you towards a playoff shot, but in terms of stab- establishing a culture with some of these young guys, some of that does matter and mm-hmm. not getting complacent with losses does matter. And I think you send Morgan down and you go, listen, we, we want to showcase young guys and we want to get young guys working and so on and so forth, but we also want to win games and we want to build towards the future. And we probably need to trade Derek Broussard. So, you know, at some point your development, if it's not coming along, at least, and I don't know that that's how they feel, but it seems like that might be how they feel. If your development is, if you're not best served developing here, th- then maybe we have to move other priorities up on the list ahead of that that specific development because you might be able to develop better down in Lehigh anyway. Yeah. And I think you're right. I, I wonder, if, had it not been for all the injuries this year, ideally how much time they would see Morgan Frost this season because you weren't anticipating injuries to Couturier or Hayes, so you probably didn't think you were going to see a ton of him this year would be my guess, but yeah. I don't know. Like I said, if, if they chose to keep him up and say, we want him to develop here, we want him to get comfortable. We want him to push past this. Uh, you know, now he kind of has this reputation of, he gets called up. He plays pretty well after, for, through that initial adrenaline. And then once it wears off, he fades a little, if they wanted to do that, I'd be like, okay, I respect that move because you, you want that for the future. Mm-hmm. But flip side, you know, we've, we've talked about the Broussard of it all. I do think they want to get win games. I do think there are veterans who are tired of losing games. I do think they want to play well. I think they want to play good hockey. And I think probably serves them better to have someone else in that spot. Maybe. Yeah. For I now. Agree. For now. Yeah, for now. Exactly. And I, I really don't think sending Morgan to the Phantoms is really going to stun his growth. I think there's a, there's good growth opportunities down with the Phantoms, and that's okay. Um, that I think that's fine. I don't think he's really at a sink or swim point yet with the Flyers. He's not. He's still, he's still only 22. Some guys develop differently. We all knew there was going to be an adjustment phase for him going to the NHL. He was a real skilled, smaller player at junior hockey level. And then when you get to the NHL, you have to change your game a little bit. Not everyone comes in and grabs the bull by the horns and becomes an NHL player right away. So I think there was going to be an adjustment period. I think he's going through that, especially after the challenging year last year where he hardly played because of the shoulder injury. So, 
And I, I think there is something to be said about winning culture, Taryn, as you mentioned. Uh, they're trying to probably convince guys to come back here, want to be a part of the Flyers. Like Rasmus Ristolainen is a perfect case. Is he going to be traded? Is he not? Well, if he doesn't, the Flyers are trying to resign this guy, and they want to make him probably feel like there's something being built here. And if you totally disregard winning and just totally bottom out, and let's be honest, they've bottomed out a good, a good bit already with how many games they've won compared to how many games they've lost. Uh, they got to build something and try to convince some people that next year could be something. And uh, so they do need to win and focus on some wins. Um, development is important, but also winning is important still in terms of next season. So Morgan Frost back to the Phantoms. I don't think it's a terrible thing. And Taryn, we'll see how fast uh, he can pick things up again with the Phantoms and maybe work his way back here. As we know, Taryn, uh, there's a good chance we're going to see prospects after March 21st uh, when the Flyers start retooling. And speaking of March, Taryn, let's get right into that. They're about to start March on Tuesday against the Oilers, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl and company. What do you want to see out of the Flyers in March? Um, well, I, I hate to say this, but we were talking about it last post game. When we, when you watch, when we watched last game, Al and I, um, in studio and you do get some woulda, coulda, shouldas, even with Derek Broussard, playing a bigger role than we anticipated him playing coming into the season. When you see that top line with Atkinson, Faraby, and Giroux, or you see that line, um, <clears throat> who was on that second line, Jordan? Please refresh my memory because now my brain's not working. Scott Lawton, Travis Konechny, and um, – Lindblom? Oscar Lindblom. Yeah. When you see that line, when you see Derek Broussard coming in and playing, you know, in certain sp- – like when you see Derek Broussard come in and add – useful depth and Patrick Brown come in. And I, I mean, I didn't think there'd be a day where I'm talking about how different things look with Patrick Brown, but when your depth players are Patrick Brown versus like a, a Connor Bunneman on a not great day for Connor Bunneman, it, it does change the complexion of the game a little bit. And there were times where, especially that first period, when we were talking about that top line, Al and I were sitting there looking at each other, like, geez, woulda, coulda, shoulda, like, even if they had, just that top six really solidly there all season and some support that was more solid all season. There's a lot there. There were a lot of things that I liked from parts of that game. And I want to have more woulda, coulda, shoulda games. I, I want that because that what that says to me is that when you get these guys back that are injured and we, I mean, I was a little bit shocked when I heard Wade Allison and Kevin Hayes could be back as early as like this week um, that you, I have, I will die on the hill that I think aggressive, aggressive retool, whatever that means. I, I do think that's the necessary move. I don't think exploding everything and starting from ground zero is the move. I genuinely don't. Um, but if you have these woulda, coulda, shoulda games, even if you trade Claude Giroux, knowing that you're getting somebody's back who are big, big difference makers. I think it makes you feel better about maybe we can regress aggressively retool into something that's a, a playoff team, whether it's a bubble playoff team or not next year. And a team that can really contend with just a couple more pieces the year after that. I, I mean, that's the hope that's the most optimistic outcome. I, I know how it sounds, but um, I would like to see more one. They need to win more that period. They just need to win more. That's that's step one. But two, I want to see games where you sit there and you wonder how things might have been yeah. if they weren't the way they were. Yeah. And um, they've given us a few games like that recently. Unfortunately, they only won the last one against the Capitals. But um, and their schedule doesn't get easy. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it's Oilers, Oilers, it's Minnesota, it's Golden Knights. Panthers are in there somewhere. Like it doesn't get any easier. Um, but I do want to see health. And I do like, if they choose to bring Kevin Hayes back, what I need to see period is Kevin Hayes not be injured one more time for the rest of the season. Period. Knock on wood. Um, just for his own sake. Like I, that it's got to suck for him. Like it's just got to suck. So if he's good enough to come back, you'd hope he's, and Mike Yo said it today, and I do agree with it. The way he moves at practice now does look different than before. So you hope that that's not just 
like a placebo effect of us seeing him moving and being like, oh, look, he can move again. It does look like maybe he might actually be better. Um, but I need to see like healthy bodies back and not leave. Like you need to see. And then, I mean, realistically with that trade deadline, you need to see some, you need to see Chuck Fletcher doing, doing the work that he does on the phones is the other thing. And it'd be really interesting. Like, what do you expect them to get back for Claude Giroux? I was asked this question the other day and I was like, it's a great question. I don't know that I have a solid answer, but what would you like to see them get back for Claude Giroux? Yeah, it's a great question. It really is. Um, if they go the prospect route, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind a top prospect that's like really knocking on the door, like a guy that can be a difference maker come next season. Um, and if they go picks, I would obviously I think they need to get a first round pick, multiple picks, uh, whether it be a first and a second in the future. Um, but I think Claude Drew is such a valuable piece that they need to really cash in on that, whether it's pro- ready ready now prospects, maybe even a player. Uh, and a first round pick, something of in, in that ballpark, because uh, I don't think he can, you know, there's a massive decision. So I don't think you can uh, sell Claude Drew short. Um, you don't absolutely have to move him. Obviously he needs to waive the no trade clause. Um, I don't think it would be a terrible thing if Claude Drew was here in the future. So like, you don't want to miss on this trade. I think you need to get serious, serious value back. Uh, Claude Drew is an icon in this city. He's an icon in Flyers history. Make sure you get it right, or at least, at least make sure you get a ton because back where you're not second-guessing. I almost think the amount of teams that think that they are cup contenders this year makes Claude even more valuable because they're all jockeying for the same group of players. And Claude Giroux has put himself at the front of the pack of players they're jockeying for. Yep. And I wonder if you can't get a ready-now prospect and like a first a first rounder just based off of like supply and demand. There's one Claude Giroux that's available right now. Like there's one. Yep. And I I just, I do the supply and demand of it all. I, I, cause I, when I was asked about it, I was like, ideally I would like a top ready now prospect, like top and like a first rounder. Like if that's because I think yeah. and I, in Minnesota, I think will get aggressive for him. And so if you're not Minnesota, then you need to be as aggressive as Minnesota will be. And I wonder how aggressive that could get. And I could be talking crazy because all of this is, you know, there's so many moving parts and you just don't even know. But um, it's I'm very interested to see what the value is, yeah. what it becomes. Yeah, it's, it's kind of my big March question is yeah. if Claude goes, what does he go for? Especially I mean, when I talked to Chuck and we were talking about it, um, you know, he said, you're not just trading a good player. You're trading a, a Flyers Hall of Fame player that you already know is going to have his name in the rafters and probably have his number retired at some point. And that's a different value level than just a good player. There's there's more meaning to that. And I think I mean, good on Chuck for being you know aware of what that means. Um, but it, it'll be. It'll make for an interesting March. Flyers Talk is brought to you by Great Railing. Stop into Great Railing for the highest quality and lowest prices on all your railing, decking, and fencing needs. Yeah, Taryn, if I'm a contending team that feels like you have a shot to win it all, I mean, I'm drooling at the chance of trying to get Claude Drew. It's scary to think of Claude Drew going to a contending team and almost being looked at as like, a piece, a complimentary piece. Like obviously he's going to go to a contending team and be a really good player. But if you're a contender, you, you have depth and you're looking at a piece to put you over the top. I mean, Claude Drew's an ideal guy to, to be in a complimentary role where he doesn't have to have the world on his shoulders. He can just be a part of it. Uh, I, can, I mean, that's a scary thought if you're a contending team. So yeah, I hope the Flyers get something really good in return if they do decide to part ways. And Taryn, I'm with you. March, I can't help but think of that trade deadline. We hear Chuck Fletcher saying aggressively retool. I want to see it be put in action. I think they are where they are at that point. Um, they are a team that needs to retool and really gear up for next season. I want to see them put that into action, move the pieces that you have to move, get quality return, and be ready for next year. Um, so who are your who are who are your of the of the names discussed? We don't have to go through every name on the team because we know there are certain players that, are, that aren't. Of the names that you feel like are really on the table, the the discussed names, who are you keeping, and who are you trading? 
if Jordan's the GM, GM Hall. A GM Hall. <laughs> I love it. Well, two like two prospects that I, I think are truly untouchable, Cam York, Tyson Forrester. I just don't mm-hmm. think there's any way the Flyers would part with them. And obviously, I don't even think they're in a position to do so. Or they're selling. Um, so they're not looking to part ways with their future. Two of the first-round picks that this regime has had uh, that they're really high on. Guys that could be uh, flirting with roles next year. Cam York, certainly. And Tyson Forrester, not yet. Uh, he's obviously gone through the shoulder injury. Yeah. So he's really recovering. But two guys that Phil needs that the team has. Puck-moving defenseman that puts up points. And a guy that's a shoot-first winger that can score from the circles. Uh, a big area the Flyers need. So those are untouchables I can think of. Um, but I do wonder, Taryn, if like guys like Travis Konechny or Ivan Provorov, like I do wonder if the team is fully sold on keeping those players. Like, are they parts of the future, or are could Chuck Fletcher have a huge hockey trade up his sleeve? I'm not asking what the team is doing. I'm asking what Jordan Hall as GM. We're talking about. You know, the Broussards, the Bronze, the Ristolinens, the Giroux. Who else is who else is like a, a big name chatter? And Martin Jones. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing, you, Jordan? What are you doing with the um like you know on Facebook, there's like single in a relationship, it's complicated. They seem like they're the it's complicated group right now as we approach the trade deadline. What are you doing with the it's complicated people? I'll rip them off real quick. I will say, like, Martin Jones, Derek Broussard, Justin Braun have to be traded. Uh, I like all those guys. I think they're very quality players, and I think you need to get value for them. Expiring contracts, not really a part of the future. They were they were supposed to be a part of a winning group this year. It's not happening. You have to trade those guys. James Van Reems likes a, pro- a guy I think you need to dangle out there and see what you can get for him, given his contract, the cap hit, and that there's only, I think, one year after this year left on it. Um and then I would say with uh, like Konechny and Provorov and some of those guys that are under contract, I wouldn't rule out listening to trades. Uh, maybe the Flyers have a massive hole and they can fill it by trading a player that uh, has immense value in terms of age, being under contract, team control. Uh, it would be a loud trade. I- I'm not thinking Konechny and Provorov or guys like a Limblom or a Lawton are on the move, but uh you know, I don't think you can rule that out. Uh, I think you being where the Flyers are, aggressively retool means everything's on the table, as Chuck Fletcher said. So if a team comes calling and comes knocking and wants to listen or make it make a deal on the table for a player like a Connect or a Provrov, I, I wouldn't put it past Chuck Fletcher to listen on those guys. Uh, I, th- I think that's where the Flyers are. Um, a really hard, aggressive retool. Nothing's out of the question other than like your no brainers guys that are going to be here. How about you, Taryn? Any other surprises? You well, think? The, the, the question mark one, the one that seems to, to be the big question mark one is are, are you going to pay risk the line and then, and keep him, or are you going to ship him out of town also? Yeah. Yeah. For me, I would resign risk the line and I would go hard at bringing him back. And I think the Flyers will, I think there's a lot of talk about him definitely being traded and wanting to play in the playoffs. I get that. But I think the Flyers are actually in a decent spot to win him over and convince him to stay. And I think Chuck Fletcher wants to because they value the way he plays. They think he can be a part of the future here. He's only 27. And will he probably right get the defensemen are getting paid a lot of money right now, yeah. though? <laughs> so yeah, they are. That's the other yeah. question. Yeah, and I guess I'm wondering if like the Flyers are going to make some moves, perhaps maybe loud or small, to really clear up cap and make sure you can keep a rest of line in. Um, I think they still like him. Like one bad season team wise isn't going to change that. And yeah. I think they've been committed to keeping him ever since they got him. Um, what about you, Taryn? What do you think Arista Line is on the move? Do you think he will stay? Do you like him of being a part of this? I if okay, if I'm GM and I don't like personally, this is okay. This is Taryn talking as Taryn pretending to be GM, not actually what I would do if I was a GM, just for my own sanity's sake, I would trade him for at least whatever value I gave away. Like, I don't think you'll get Robert, like a Robert Hague in a first rounder back, but at least get like, for my own sanity, I'd be like, can I get like a first and a second and just yeah. <laughs> figure, you figure out the undrafted or the unrestricted free agency yourself, like whatever. Yeah. Um, that would be my sanity move in that situation. I don't know. I don't, Genuinely, do I think it's the best move for the team? Probably not. But especially if you're going to dangle Provy, because then you're talking about, I mean, 
like you're basically going to have to get well if Alice comes back healthy. Although I feel like we're talking about you know um, a mythical creature at this point. If like if Alice comes back healthy, but then you get rid of Proby, and then you want Sandheim and Risto to develop chemistry together, and then you're maybe calling up Cam York, but you're trading Justin Braun. This like you're essentially next year restructuring your entire defense if you also trade him. So I think if you dangle Pro V and you definitely trade Braun, you probably have to re-sign him. Um, might be my approach there, just for the sake of like you're gonna have to restructure your entire defense anyway. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, but for, like sanity's sake, I'm I'm a path of least resistance person. So like I said, my own sanity, I would be like, let me figure out who will give me the value I spent on him. <laughs> probably yeah. move I would make. Um, I think Braun has become incredibly valuable, like would be a very valuable piece to certain teams. I wouldn't be shocked to see him go. Um, I actually like Martin Jones, but I, I kind of agree with what you're saying there. I, I, I think you let Claude Giroux lead you to water with his situation. Obviously he deserves that amount of respect and, I, I, I get, I think you ask for everything, you know, at the kitchen sink once he says what he'd like to do, but I think him leading you to water, like I said, there is probably the right move. Um, Broussard needs to play as many games in March as humanly possible. That's the other thing in March I need to see is Broussard playing, get that trade value way up uh, yes. from where it's at and, you know, probably got to go. And then who else are we talking about? Who else is the the names that are on the, trade block right now i'm trying to think maybe like a jvr it's a tough spot with him yeah i i think with jvr you're gonna have to absorb some of his contract probably yeah you would probably i think you would maybe have to eat some money yeah so no. that would be uh an interesting that's an interesting one also because i mean obviously they left him unprotected for the expansion draft so i i think that kind of speaks to to the commitment level to JVR. Um, but I think if you're shipping them out, you're going to have to eat some of it. So yeah. he's an, he's an interesting one too. And I do just as a person, I like James. I, I, you know, I think he's, it, it's so interesting because last year I thought he had a really, really good year. The way, yes. not just the points he produced in streaks, but the way he played, I thought when everybody else was really down, he was really like he was adding certain aspects to his game that we hadn't really seen him do like predominantly do those things. Um, I just, with all like who he's been on lines with and the way the year has gone, I don't think he's contributed in the way he typically would, but you, it does make you wonder like how valuable is he to another team where maybe he's not, he's playing with players that complement what he's trying to do better. Yeah. And that what's that, what's his value to those teams? Like what are they willing to give up for? I'm interested to see what they do with him, but I think I would do, I'm with you on the, the Braun Broussard Jones of it all. Um, I, the defense is, I'm very interested to see what happens with this defense because yeah. some of the things I've heard, I'm like, so essentially you're keeping Travis Sanheim and Ryan Ellis and everything else. You're like, figure it out. And that it's not that it's like, it's not that easy to get defensemen. Like it's yeah. just you, I get Cam York's in the wings and probably, you know, ready, but trying to trying to build four defensemen when you you definitely only have two yeah. that you want to because the Provi's name has been out there a lot more than I anticipated personally like I see it come up a lot and I'm Ooh. sort of like okay but I I wasn't anticipating seeing his name come up quite as much as it has yeah and I don't want to act like I'm like I want connecting your pro rod to be traded. I think they're quality players that can be a part of something here, but I really think the Flyers are in such an alarming spot where nothing is off the table. And those are good players at a good age that people are going to be attracted in. So maybe the Flyers have something they love out there. And what's the best way to 
to get it, maybe to part ways there with a player like a Konechny or a Provorov. So I really don't think they they won't listen on those guys. But it is fascinating because my gut tells me that maybe they want to see Provorov and Ellis next year. Like maybe they really think something's there and they're, they want people to be like, hey, here's what we thought this could be. Here it is. Both guys are healthy. Both are really good together. That's how I feel. I, I don't – I think – Here's what I would do. I would, I would, and this is kind of what Chuck said. Like there are very few names that are not on the table when teams call me. It's what the price for some of those names that are on the table is. I would set my price for Provorov very high because I do want to see him with Ellis next year. Like I would like to see Provorov in a flyer sweater next year, playing next to Ryan Ellis for a full season. I think there's a lot to like out of that. Yeah. That being said, there might be a team out there that's like, hey, we're willing to give you all our gold for Ivan Provorov. And if you're Chuck Fletcher, you could use some gold right now. So yeah. um, it will be a really interesting trade deadline because I like I think we've said a lot all season. There are good players on this team. There are things to like about this team. And other teams know that. What are they willing to pay for those things that you like? Yeah. It'll be interesting. So true. And, and the reason I can maybe somewhat see is – they love Cam York. So maybe they envision Cam York, who is a lefty shot like Ivan Provrov, being a top pair defenseman with Ryan Ellis or somebody else. And then they can see their second pair slotting out, you know, in a different way. Maybe saying Hyman Marcelon is the second pair in the future. So maybe they're building more reason to understand parting ways with some of these players that are. And it's not like Cam costs you a bunch of money next year. You want to talk about cap space. Yeah, exactly. It's a perfect point, Taryn. Exactly. And, Obviously, we know when Chuck Fletcher was hired. Some of these guys, a lot of these guys, the Flyers did not draft. Uh, you know, they did not sign like a JVR. So they could be more open to really seriously, aggressively retooling this thing. And uh, I'm with you. That's why this March could be such a telling and fascinating month because the Flyers have a lot that they can do. Uh, you know what I've come to realize is that the – the struggles of this season have made me weirdly like optimistic for what could be next year with everybody coming back. And if it doesn't go well from the start, I'm going to be really upset. I know. <laughs> I think the Flyers are somewhat in a run it back mode. I don't want to say like they're going to go in to next year with the same roster, but I think no. they really did like what they had on paper and they feel like they never saw it. I bet mm -hmm. that's in the mind of Chuck Fletcher and in the mind of many people they never got to see what they had, and they're fighting that, like, do we keep certain pieces that we really liked and we just haven't seen them yet, or do we, yes, do we seriously change everything and understand it didn't work? And Well, that's why know. I wouldn't be, like, super surprised also, and this is based on absolutely nothing other than, like, that run-it-back mindset. If, like, Claude Giroux waves his, his no-move clause and is like, yeah, I'd like to go compete somewhere this year, and then comes back and, like, maybe resigns next year, and it's just like, let's give this group – let's like, we never gave this group a go. Let's give this group a go. Yeah. And I, I – that again, I could be a 1,000% wrong. I have zero sources on that information. Sure. But um, it is weird because I feel like last year – the thing that works against that whole argument, though – is that last year when it went poorly felt like a we're turning the page to next season. This, this year was weird, blah, 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 yada, yada. And I get that Chuck really aggressively retooled that roster to come into this season, and then it didn't work, but that roster didn't play. So I, I, I'm i with you with the whole, like, run it back situation. I I, I said it last, last podcast as well. I think a team that even just has Kevin Hayes and Sean Couturier back – is a very, very different hockey team than the team that we see. Yeah. And that would be interesting. Yeah. The Flyers are not going to be stripping it all down and starting from scratch. We've, they've said it. They don't believe in that. And I don't really think. Yeah, but people want them to. I know. Like, yeah. like people really. Do, do you, like, I don't know. I, I when, yeah. when I sit there and I say to people, like, okay, so you're trading off essentially everything yeah and they're like yeah i would keep like a couple guys and i'm like how many guys and then they start naming guys and it's like eight guys and i'm like so that's not a burn it to the ground and retool that's a rebuild that's an aggressive retool this is what you're talking about yes like you you want to keep pro v and ellis is injured so you don't really care about him but you do want to keep him and you want to keep sanheim and you don't really want to pay risto 
but you you want to you, like he's been one of their better defensemen, so you do want to keep Risto, and then you're keeping Carter Hart. So we're already at five people, and I'm just through blue liners and goaltender, and then you want to keep like Scott Lawton because he works hard, and uh, Joel and Sean and Kevin, mm-hmm. and so now we're at nine people. So yeah. like he, every every person I talk to, this is how the conversation goes, and I'm like, yeah. so you don't really want to rebuild because yeah. look at Arizona, look at Arizona, you want to. Do you want to do that? I don't exactly. think you want to do that. Like, so, I don't know. It, it, like, it's okay to say that the Flyers have some pieces here that are that can it's be – It's not okay, though. That's what I've learned. Yeah. It's <laughs> not okay to say that. Right. The Flyers do have players here that are going to be liked at the deadline and that they could be liked for the future here in Philadelphia. We'll see where it goes, but it should be really fun to watch unfold, and we'll make sure we have all the coverage here. Yeah, on the I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun newscasts coming up for you guys. Oh, absolutely, Taryn. Yeah, Looking forward to it. I can't wait for those. <laughs> well, Taryn had I love you. my job. Sorry, guys. I love my job. <laughs> she it's knows. Just, trade deadline broadcasts are very stressful. <laughs> they are. You don't know what's going to happen. You have to react to it on the fly. Taryn and I know it's not always the most enjoyable. There's a lot time. of name pronunciations of prospects that we have never heard of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, Calling Listen. people in the local markets. How do you say? What do you do? What? Okay. Yes. It's, it's pronounced ooh instead of you. Okay. Yeah. 2019-20 was a nice season for reporters because we knew they were going to add a couple guys but not do anything crazy. It was kind of nice and calm. Like, all right. This and it was great. like Nate Thompson. You know, Eric like a Frank. nice, easy Nate yeah. Thompson. Who was the other one they added? Eric um, Grant. What was it? Eric Grant. I knew it was Derek. I was like, who was yeah. the other one? And all I kept thinking was Derek Broussard. <laughs> like, yeah. Wasn't it even Eric crazy? Grant. Was he from Am- Anaheim before the Flyers got him? Yeah, the Ducks right? and then yeah. Thompson came from the Canadians. So. And Derek Grant had been on like seven teams in seven years before that. Yeah, he had played a lot. Like He was kind of like a journeyman, uh, but only yeah. 30. So. Nice guy. He was very nice. Nice, very nice. Very easy to work guy. with. Solid, very solid very bottom, bottom six, fourth line type of guy. But anyway. That is the past, and we are ready for the present and whatever that holds. But Taryn Hatcher. Well, Frank, we're in the present. We're ready for the future. Don't yell at me. You no, I'm sorry, but we're in the present. We're not we're not ready for we're ready for the future. I think we're is ready what for the future. You know. You know what I meant. Now is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Ah. I like that. I like that a I lot. I don't think that's actually how you I think that's not right. I'm it's not sure. Something, it's something I don't know. If you've made it to this point in the podcast, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, Taryn, thank you so much as always. Great seeing you. Great chatting with you. Um, we will catch out Taryn uh, on, on Flyers. Catch out, catch out Taryn. Catch out or catch Taryn on Flyers pre and post game live coming up this week with three. And Jordan, he makes an appearance. Jordan makes an appearance on Flyers pregame live these days, guys. Yes, Cisco Allsie. WebEx. It. Yeah, so. Alzi and the Clur via WebEx by Cisco. Yes. <laughs> but, Taryn, thank you so much as always. A big thank you to Ben Barry, our podcast producer and guru. And Flyers fans, of course, as always, thank you for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. Wherever you get your podcast, please rate and listen. And we cannot wait to talk to you next time. <laughs>